All right. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome. We're so excited to be here today. Um, I'm Sally Herships. I am the co-host of the Center for Public Integrity's new podcast about Trump's 2017 tax bill, The Heist. Um, and I'm really excited to have with me today, John Fassman, Washington correspondent for The Economist and host of Checks and Balance, um, an American politics podcast, which you should all subscribe to right immediately, away, immediately after this panel. Um, and the wonderful Joseph Stieglitz, uh, professor at Columbia University, Nobel Prize winning economist, and he has a fabulous new book out, People, Power, and Profit, which you should pick up a copy of. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, some of you already know that there's an Ask a Button button at the bottom of the window here. And so if you have a, a question, please post it there, and we will um, respond to questions um, uh, as we move through the discussion. Um, so our first question today that we want to address is really what the impact of Donald Trump's 2017 tax law has been in the country. And so I think I want to start with a question for, for Joe, and then I'll toss it over to John. Um, so the president paid uh, not very much in taxes, $750, I believe, and this is something he brags about. <laughs> What are, what are a couple of specific examples, maybe a short-term example and a long-term example of the way that a president, this president has impacted our tax system and specifically in ways that might impact the people who are here watching today, just everyday Americans? Well, the tax bill that was passed in uh, December of 2017, um, was probably the worst tax bill ever. And uh, one aspect of that was, you know, uh, ordinary people usually like a tax cut. Uh, they don't think uh, necessarily through that uh, tax cuts may translate into poor public services, poor public services will impact them. They just look at the tax uh, benefits. But this is a case where they figured out that those tax benefits were all going, or most of them going to the top. You know, we were discussing before the, uh, the whether it, it's always called a, a tax cut, but it's not a tax cut for most Americans. It was a tax cut for the billionaires for the corporations, but when it is fully implemented in 2027, it will be a tax rise, a tax increase for the majority of American citizens, a majority of American taxpayers. You know, a couple of days ago, um, there was the vice presidential debate and there was a lot of noise about whether Biden was proposing a tax increase for most Americans. And uh, uh, Harris made it very clear that Biden was not going to increase uh, taxes for anybody under $400,000. If I had been in the debate, I would have pointed something else out that the Trump proposal would Trump is committed to doing committed is to raising the taxes between now and 2027 on every income group over ten thousand dollars basically all taxpayers will see their tax rate increase between now and 2027, and it's not just a promise, it's something that he's signed, sealed, and delivered. Republicans all have been engaged in this act of deception where they lowered the taxes for the before the election, bribing people to vote for them, 
And then they forgot to remind them, which they should have done. Pensioners, by the way, when we gave you that tax cut, we didn't remind you enough. You are going to be paying more taxes. We've already gotten the tax rate going up. But not a surprise he didn't advertise that. But every income group is going to see their tax rate increase. Now, what's really striking was for the lower income Americans. He's not waiting until 2027 or 2025. It happens in 2021. They're getting a higher tax in 2021 than they have today. So he's delivering for the poor right away. And when I say the poor, basically the bottom two thirds of Americans, the bottom two thirds of Americans are going to get a tax increase between now and 2021, signed, sealed, and delivered. So let me ask let me ask um, John a question because he's been kind of traveling around the country talking to American voters. And what Joe, what you've just described, it's kind of it reminds me of a magician, a story I once did for an art show called Studio 360, where magicians talk about distraction. They show you something over here to take away from something over here. So Trump talked a lot about um, and has a lot of support, right? He's the law and order candidate. But at the same time, law and order requires a lot of taxes. So I'm really curious to know, right? That's what pays the salaries of firemen, policemen. <laughs> How does he sell this idea of being the president who's cutting taxes but then also call himself the president who is gonna pay for law and order. Um, those two ideas seem to be directly in conflict. Like how does that resonate with his base? I don't think it resonates in quite that sort of causal a way, right? His fondness for law and order, I might correct that a little bit. He is the order president, right? He's not terribly interested in rule of law. What he wants is order on his terms, right? So as the order president, he expresses it through a sort of cultural affinity for policemen. And he also taps into a longstanding cultural disdain for taxes on the right. And so I think that, that for instance, his the, the tax story, the story that he only paid $750 in taxes, that was not terribly damning to most of his supporters because to them, the story he's selling is that he's a shrewd businessman and he minimized his tax bill just like they did. He just happened to do it much better than they did, right? So everybody wants to pay a pittance in taxes and he is sort of a he has there's an element of sort of wish fulfillment in his presidency that he fulfilled by that 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 he fulfilled by paying so little in taxes and by expressing personal affinity for law and order and policemen but the idea that you need taxes to fund the police system that's just that's not an argument that i ever heard from his from his support <laughs> it's not a it's not a it's not a it's not a breaking point yeah it's almost that's like that's well, you know one of the definitions of populist uh, is that they don't understand budget constraints. They're able mm -hmm. to look at those two issues in a totally schizophrenic way. They like low taxes and they like government expenditures. And uh, the and then never the twain should meet. Uh, so the idea that there should be some way of, of uh, you have to finance in one way or another, you have to finance your expenditures. That's uh, uh, outer space. So uh, th that seems to me, it, it is often viewed as a definition of a populist. And uh, that's what Trump is about. What is so surprising is that the Republican Party used to be the party saying, fiscal responsibility. Uh, that was their, almost their motto. <laughs> and they've now joined po Trump as a populist party. And they did that in December, 2017 and January, 2018, when they broke the budget. And uh, they didn't do it back in 2010, when we really needed more fiscal stimulus to recover from the the great recession which they had helped bring about they 
They voted again. You know, they wouldn't allow that to happen. But then in 2017, they had a chance to give a uh, a budget breaking uh, 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 tax bill for the corporations and the billionaires. And uh, they put aside all concerns about deficits. What, what, Joseph? So that, that I believe is going to add approximately $2 trillion to the national debt over the next decade or so. That seems like a lot of money. Um, what kind of impact is that debt going to have? Like what, what should, what should um, John and I be telling our kids? We both have, um, right, John, you have kids who are around, you know, mm -hmm. 13, maybe younger. I, my stepson's 13. So <clears throat> about a decade, they're going to be in their 20s coming out of college. What should they be thinking about? So when I think about deficits, the, the first thing is, what do you do with the spending? You know, I, I'm very critical of looking only at the liability side, which is what deficits are, of, of the balance sheet. If you took that money and built roads, invested in education, invested in green transition, in technology, then we have a stronger society, a stronger economy. What they did with that money was to give a tax break, as I said, to the corporations. The deal was supposed to be that the corporations would then take their money, invest it in the country, and though the government wouldn't have anything to show on its balance sheet, at least the country as a whole would have something to show on its balance sheet. That the government liability went up, but the private sector assets went up with the with the great in, uh, increased investment. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. What we now know happened disproportionately with the money is that it went for share buybacks. It reached almost a trillion dollars in 2018 alone. Record numbers. And that the share buybacks went to the wealthiest 10%, most of it went to the wealthiest 1% of Americans. A lot of it to the wealthiest one-tenth of 1% of, of Americans. So that didn't lead to a stronger uh, long-run economy. It did goose the economy for a little while. You know, whenever you have that much spending going on, uh, even if the money wasn't well spent, whenever you have that much, it gooses the economy. The question is, is it sustained, sustainable? Obviously, if it doesn't go into investment, it's not sustainable. But it wasn't even sustainable in the short run. So that the forecast for 2020, before the pandemic happened, was that growth would slow to probably under 2%, mm -hmm. which is back, which was what it was weaker than it was under Obama, uh, under the recovery. So um, the president could claim, and again, a kind of short-sighted, uh, the economy was doing very well. Yes, if you goose the economy enough with that kind of sugar high, it will do well for a short while. Uh, but it wasn't sustainable. It reminds me a little bit of when corporations are trying to file their quarterly reports and are very focused on the near term rather than the long term, um, which brings me to a question for John. This was something you and I were chatting about, which is that Trump has always presented himself as a really successful businessman. Um, and what does it mean that Trump supporters Trump supporters have talked a lot about how Trump is different. He's not a politician. What does it mean that they want the country run by a businessman, not a politician? I mean, I hope this presidency puts that cliche finally to rest because businesses and government run differently. They have different aims. I think what most people mean when they say they want government to run like a business is they want government to be efficient and accountable. But that's not necessarily running it like a business. I think what they mean when they say, well, we want our government to run like government in Switzerland or, or, or we want government to run like Swiss government 
with an efficient, accountable delivery of services. That's not really what a business does. You know, businesses thrive when they offer people something they want to buy in voluntary transactions. That's not what government does. Businesses have customers. Governments don't. They have citizens to whom they have to deliver services. There's a clear sort of uh, metric of success in business, and that's profit. What is the clear metric of success in government delivery of services? They're just incompatible goals. And I hope, I hope that we don't hear, at least for a while, that we want a businessman who will run government like a business again. Yeah, can I, can I say, I agree 100%, but there's one other element I would add. Uh, there are many different kinds of businessmen. Yeah, yeah. And there are entrepreneurial businessmen that innovate. Mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, ethical businessmen that uh, do a great job of providing mm -hmm. services in an honest way to their customers. And then there are scammers. There are people who make their living out of taking advantage of others. You know, we all know that. Uh, and uh, there are even reputable companies that, you know, uh, the drug companies to push the opioid crisis. We have companies that are uh, monopolists uh, that make money by taking advantage of their market power. Mm -hmm. And the worst of all are the businessmen like Trump, which uh, offer something like Trump University that takes advantage of people's aspirations to get ahead. A business person who uh, reneges on his contracts and doesn't pay his suppliers um a business person who lives off of gambling you know these are praying to the worst aspects praying to vulnerabilities praying to aspirations and not really uh behaving according to the ethical principle that good businesses and i think the majority of businesses in america are good businesses so when you say a business person uh you don't want to the dregs of the business community. And that's what we wound up with. I think it's also, it's kind of interesting, right? Trump's background, John, as a salesman. Can you talk a little bit about how that has seeped over into politics and the way he's campaigning? Like, I remember being really surprised when I saw his name pop up. I think, what was it? We got stimulus checks or- With um, his name signed to them. Yeah, yeah, he's a very good, he's a good marketer. It's been a marketing presidency. I mean, I think that's what it, it, there's a, it's, it's, it's presidency as as a reality show. And that's what seems most important to him, that, that, that people know him for his achievements, that he will sign his name to a stimulus check. He in that video that he posted yesterday. He seemed to offer all American seniors the same Regeneron therapy he got with no actual way to to deliver it. Right. And so it's it's uh, it's been much thinner on substance than most presidencies have been. And I would argue that most presidents should be. Um, and I would love to bring in a question because they're really starting to pop up. Um, okay, this is our most popular question. It has an upvote, so I'm really excited. Okay, so maybe, Joe, this is one for you. And I think you've touched on this, but maybe we'll just um, talk about it again briefly. So, Joe, please compare the tax saving of Trump's um, it says tax bill, a tax cut, but we want to refer to it as a tax bill. So please compare the tax saving of Trump's tax bill to the average taxpayer and the wealthy. I think, yeah. So please, how how has the average wealthy person done versus, um, yeah? So there's an interesting uh, number here. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, the average millionaire is going to save uh, uh, in 2027, when it's fully implemented, something like $64,000 in taxes. And that number is approximately the average income of America's household. <laughs> so the tax gift to the millionaires is the same as the total income of the average American family. There's another number that actually is very linked to that. Uh, the increase in the taxes paid 
by uh, the average family that's around the poverty level, 20, 30,000, um, which is the, uh, uh, a family in poverty is, is just over 20,000. But look in that range. That income category, the Trump tax bill increases, increases their taxes by $760. That's the same amount that Trump is paying total in taxes. So he gave an increase to people at the poverty level or just above of an amount equal to the total taxes his the so-called multi-billionaire is paying in total. And that shows you the inequity of our system. And only someone who doesn't know arithmetic uh, could believe that this, the government could function. If everybody behaved like him, how are we going to have, as you said, the firemen and the policemen? This is, this is something, um, I know this is not directly related, but while we have you here, John, I was pretty excited to ask you about this because I think it ties into the same sort of um, magical thinking or, I, I don't know, um, lack of observation of the facts. So um, Trump uh, got got the got COVID and a mm -hmm. lot of people around him got sick. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about, my, do my dog is outraged by this. Um, can you talk a little bit about how he is able to persuade people um, that this is just not a big deal? I think to a lot of people, his experience with COVID shows that COVID is not, or sh yeah, shows that COVID is not that serious, right? That that is the argument you've heard on the right for a while, that we have to open up, that there's some risk to older people, but the risks are not worth shutting down the economy for. And I think that his experience with it what it suggests to me is that he had extraordinary medical care and that extraordinary interventions produce extraordinary results. I think what it suggests to a lot of people who are predisposed to support him is that it shows that COVID itself was not that big a deal, that we're all going to get it eventually, and that, of course, he got it because he was out talking to his constituents while Joe Biden was hiding away in his basement, and he got it, and it's not a big deal, and we should also not worry about it. I think that's that's the argument that I've, that I've, that I've heard over the past few weeks when I've been out and about. So it's sort of like aspirational coronavirus thinking, like, this isn't yeah. so bad. We should all just, yeah. you know, we all just I mean, got it. It would be I better. think there was. I mean, I think there was a successful, there was a plausible argument he could have made after the coronavirus, which is that I got this disease. I had extraordinary medical care. I'd like to do everything I can to get this care to everybody else. We should all be careful. The pandemic is serious. But with, with, with the right care, it's manageable. But that wasn't the argument that has come out, right? The argument that has come out is that the coronavirus is not that big a deal. Don't be afraid of it. Don't let it dominate your life. I think that's very dangerous from a public health perspective because it is in fact quite dangerous, especially to older people who comprise a disproportionate share of his of his supporters. But not only to older people, it's actually dangerous. You know, uh, older people have a higher probability of dying. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, I know people who are, you know, in their 50s who, 40s who've, who, who've died. So um, uh, uh, it is not the case that uh, you can just ignore it. Yeah. And one of the imp other important things that, that uh, Republican uh, framing of this for Gex, they want to think that the shutdown, lockdowns caused the economic downturn. The evidence is overwhelmingly, it's fear and justifiable fear of getting the disease. People don't want to get on the airplane. They don't want to eat in a restaurant. And uh, no matter what you say, people are justifiably not going to go on airplanes and are not going to be eating in restaurants, things that are relatively easy to avoid. People make a cost-benefit analysis and, and they don't, don't do those things. And the only way we're going to get our economy back to normal and any semblance of normal is to get the pandemic under control. I, I want to ask you a question, Joe, about that. Years ago, when I was a producer or an intern um, at Radio Lab, which is kind of a science show, a show about big ideas, 
I had to, um, they were doing a story about this famous uh, marshmallow experiment where, or was it cookies, some kind of goodie. And if you had a little kid and you put them alone in the room with two cookies or you would, or one cookie, one cookie. So let's all imagine we're a little kid, we're alone in the room and we have one cookie. And the scientist would say to the little kid, Joe, you can have one cookie now, or if you wait, you can have two cookies later. Is what's going on with the virus and the economy, it feels sort of like a, a reversal of that. It, it's like, it, it seems like we're very focused on the short term and that it feels like it's more expensive to, to try to keep the economy tottering on short term, but then ultimately it's gonna cost us more. Is that is that what's going on here? Because we're not in able part. to leave our cookies. Yeah, in part. I mean, it, it, it's very clear that if we make the, you know, let me give you an example. New Zealand, very early on, had a very, very tough lockdown. And they succeeded in getting rid of the disease, uh, almost 100%. And then their economy started going again, not perfectly, because they don't get tourists and they're dependent on tourists. It's not their own problem, but uh, you know, people didn't, and they, they didn't want to have the disease brought in. Um, then they had a second wave. You know, a few people came in back home, New Zealanders returning, or uh, and they then again put the lockdown, and now they've again uh, knocked it out. Um, so it's very clear that by having a really effective short-term uh, response, they've done a lot better. So it's exactly your marshmallow. They said, okay, I, I'm not going to eat the, the candy now. Uh, I'm going to be tough on myself. It's going to be hard. But I know it's better to be hard on myself now and in a month be able to go much back to normal than have what's happened in the United States. 200 and some thousand people have died and our economy uh, is really in shambles. So thank you for clarifying that for me. Um, so a question for both of you. Maybe I'll start with John first. This is um, from audience. And this question comes from Larry Holman. Didn't Trump, John, didn't Trump have his life saved by socialized medicine? <laughs> I mean, Trump had his life, well, I don't know if he had his life saved. Trump received first-rate medical care that was available to a president at taxpayer expense. Presidents get medical care at taxpayer expense. Is that is that uh, is that a form of socialized medicine? I suppose it is, um, but I think it's not what most people think of when they think of socialized medicine. But it certainly is the case that he had his health care paid for by the taxpayer, funded by, you know, benefited. It, it, he benefited from research and development, probably funded by taxpayers as well. As um, well, I mean, if you were inclined to support. The Affordable Care Act and socialized medicine, you will see in this a cautionary tale. Can I can I just add one thing? Walter Reed is a government hospital. Yeah. And Walter Reed delivers first class health care. And those who say that government can provide first class health care are absolutely wrong. There's another interesting thing about the discussions you hear from Trump and from Pompeo and from other, they say. You know, America is number one. We're for, we are very good. But where is the leader in development vaccines before the pandemic? Everybody turns to the Oxford group. Yeah, you know, they have good universities in, in the UK. And we should be cooperating with all the universities and all the researchers around the world. And the assertion that our, our researchers are the best. They are really, really good. But there's a global community. And not to, re, you know, not to recognize the first rate work that is going on in other countries around the world is really uh, uh, doing disservice both to us and to them. I certainly assume that if that if Joe Biden wins the presidency, that the United States would join 
COVAX, right, to, to join the global effort to develop and distribute the vaccine. I think we're one of five countries not in that compact right now. Can we can we talk for a minute? I know it's a little bit outside of the um, tax bill, but it still it relates to Trump's both his political um, and economic policies. Can we talk about his his take on immigration? Because I think that that has had an enormous or can have an enormous impact on the economy. Um, what, Joe? What do you think? I know that tech companies have been particularly vocal about pres the president's um, policies toward immigration. What um, I think his claim, just very big picture, is America first, Americans getting American jobs first. What kind of impact are his policies having by barring, making it more difficult for foreigners to work in the United States? Well, let me first begin from the perspective uh, of a teacher at a university. Um, a very large fraction of our best students come from abroad. And uh, it's true in the social sciences and economics, even more true in what we call the hard sciences, uh, physics, STEM. Um, and America has been, I think unfortunately, uh, very dependent on students from abroad for research and innovation. Uh, if you look at Silicon Valley, the fraction of entrepreneurs that are uh, immigrants or first generation Americans, overwhelming uh, number are um, uh, from uh, are immigrants. And if we were to cut off that lifeline, it would undermine uh, our economic potential. I mean, the contrast yeah, you know, it's it sort of it's it sort of we talked before about the disjunction between uh, cutting taxes on the one hand and uh, wanting to have uh, law and order, fi fire all these public services. This is just as great, or even greater, because one of the strengths of America is our science, our innovation, Silicon Valley. And every year, he's proposed. 30% cutbacks in our science budgets. So there's a, you know, there's a disjoint there. You know, they've been attacking our uh, best universities. Understandable because they're critical. A lot of the people are critical of, of, of some of his policies, but that's the nature of democracies. And we're critical of, of, of everybody. I mean, you want to get the best, uh, very demanding. Um, but if you undermine our research institutions and don't allow the most talented people to come into the United States, um, our, they'll go elsewhere. Yeah. And Canada has been taking advantage of that. Uh, other countries have been taking advantage of them. It's a recipe for making sure that America is not great again. I would say in addition to that, I know I said earlier that, that, that the Trump administration, that the Trump presidency has been a marketing presidency. In this arena, I think that's not true. I think what he has, his immigration policies have really changed America's immigration system. He has dramatically lowered the number of refugees we permit to resettle here. He has made it much more difficult to claim asylum. He has put tremendous stress on the immigration court system. He has you know, there was an understanding for many years that comprehensive immigration reform would involve some mixture of border security and regularizing the 11 million undocumented people, most of whom are already in our workforce and are going to stay in our workforce. That bargain now is functionally blown up because he has turned the Republican Party in a very nativist direction. And he has done so much of this that while any of these actions singly could theoretically be overturned because he did so many of them through the agencies and through through executive orders. If Joe Biden wins the next wins the presidency, he will have to deal with a downturn, a pandemic, a drive for government reform. He'll just have so many places he'll have to spend his political capital that attacking this thicket of changes that the Trump administration made is going to be really difficult. He's also changed the Trump has also changed the terms of the debate. So it's it's as I said, it's no longer focused on that sort of bargain. In this area, in the area of immigration, policy-wise and how America thinks of itself, 
he's really changed the game and it's going to be very hard to change it back. Let me ask two questions here. Um, first, I want to ask John, because you've been out reporting um, and in communities with voters, what I want to know what they want in terms of jobs and the economy. And then I'm curious to hear, maybe that's too big of a question, but like, what, what do they realistically want? Because they want, they want police, they want firemen, they want healthcare, they want lower taxes, they want jobs. You know, like what, what are they asking for? And then Joseph, I'd be really curious to hear from you. What in a Biden presidency, what what can what can be done? Can this be undone? Can what what needs to happen? So I'm not trying to sort of caricature anyone when I say this. I'm just gonna tell you I spent the weekend before last, I was out in central Florida canvassing with Republicans uh, and with, with Republican Party officials from Florida. I kept hearing over and over again, I kept saying, what do you want from the second term of President Trump? And I kept hearing, we want him to keep doing what he's doing. We want him to keep draining the swamp. He's the most pro-American president we've ever had. He loves this country and its institutions. So politics, while you know, political journalists may like to think of voters sort of going to the booth and looking at two candidates and saying, which one has policies I agree with more and voting rationally, that's not really how people tend to vote. And so his presidency has been much more than most just because his legislative agenda is so thin and his policy achievements are, 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 are not great either. It's been a real affinity presidency. And so I think what people really want, what his supporters really want, is to continue to see him doing what he has been doing. There's a sort of, there's a sort of social or personal need they have fulfilled by seeing him in office. And that's really what they want. They want him in office more than any particular particular policy outcome. So, Joe, if if Biden wins the election, um, what does he need to do to undo what's been done? Right now, we're looking at around two trillion dollars in debt over the next decade. All of these restrictive immigration policies with a, a pretty serious impact on the economy. Well, I think one of the things will be to reverse a lot of these policies, uh, in some areas, the damage is going to be very long-term. You know, uh, he's undermined our relationships with other countries. The United States is viewed as a country you can't trust. Uh, unilaterally, we've broken uh, uh, agreements. Uh, that restoring long-term relations is going to take a long time. And He's reminded companies and countries that borders matter, that there is always a danger of another uh, erratic president being elected in the United States. And then there's not going to be that kind of confidence that America was a stable place. That's gone uh, for at least a long, long while. But the tax uh, bill can and should be repealed. Um, the savings can go partly to help the people who've done very badly over the last 40 years and partly to invest in infrastructure, education, partly to deal with the green transition. Uh, so there's a big agenda ahead. And because we have, you know, the United States is very distinctive even before Trump. We were unusual in having a regressive tax system where, uh, as Warren Buffett paid, is something wrong in a country where the richest person like Warren Buffett pays less taxes than his secretary. You know, and, and so we have lots of ways of creating a fair tax structure that won't dampen the economy, will actually stimulate the economy. So uh, that those are issues that we can... I think relatively easily address immigration. You know, uh, again, uh, there are we have a great science ex uh, establishment. You know, before we were talking about uh, the big successes in vaccines in the United States, but the, uh, in in Oxford, but the United States has developed a couple of the most you know. Uh, advanced technology vaccines. Uh, we're, we're really doing very well. 
uh, we are a very attractive place for doing science, uh, for innovation, uh, if you're, uh, and, and, even, and for entrepreneurship. So we'll be an attractive place for pe people of talent to come. So if we change our laws, I think uh, we, we will, that kind of damage can be undone. Um, and what gives me uh, a, a lot of hope is uh, the response that uh, to the Black Lives Matter that happened during the summer. And uh, the young people in America are really uh, much more tolerant, much more open. And so overall, if you look at the young people, uh, we've been moving in the right direction. And so I think uh, there is this uh, 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 a real potential there for for uh, a new era uh, once we get rid of Trump. Do you mind if I toss a question to Joe? I'm much more comfortable on my side of the notebook. How much do you think that the sort of fiscal hangover, the deficit, will hinder Biden's ability to get done what he wants to get done? How much do you worry about that in the in the near and medium term? I don't think uh, it should. Uh, it will depend a lot on uh, what happens in Congress. Uh, the The fact is the United States is not facing any inflationary pressures. So uh, we're not immediately facing any, uh, you know, th that's the reason why you start worrying about debt, too much <laughs> debt leads to too much inflation and it, it's like call it a hidden tax. Mm -hmm. But uh, if those inflationary pressures should show up, not going to happen, not going to happen for the next year, two years, maybe longer than that. If it should happen, we have lots of underutilized taxes. As I said, we mm -hmm. have a very mm -hmm. regressive tax system. Uh, we need environmental taxes. Uh, mm -hmm. We, we uh, yeah, lots of scope. But beyond that, we know how to use monetary policy. We have a lot of excess liquidity in various parts of our economy. Understandable at this moment because people feel scared, fear. Mm -hmm. The president has not managed the pandemic. <laughs> The savings rate of the United States reached 25% or in a country where normally the savings rate are 2%, 3%. So there's a lot of um, uh, uh, precautionary savings. Uh, the Fed knows how to drain liquidity, excess liquidity out of the system. Mm -hmm. So I am not worried at, at this juncture. And uh, the investments that we could make that would increase the productivity of the economy are enormous. Now, let me put it in one other way. When we emerged from World War II, we had a higher debt GDP ratio than we have today. And the spending that we did that led to that debt was dropping bombs, <laughs> was things we had to do to to win the war, mm -hmm. but it wasn't building. It wasn't building up the asset side of our balance sheet, mm -hmm. except in the area of R and D, where we were doing actually really good research during the war. So, uh, but the response, bipartisan, President Eisenhower, in the fifties, was invest more, invest more in infrastructure, education, and technology. And the result was we grew the economy. And as we grew the economy, the debt GDP ratio went down. We increased the denominator rather than cutting the numerator. Hmm. So I want to, um, John, I want to pose a politics question to you and then, um, uh, and then, Joe, come back to you with a pol with a policy uh, tax question, um, because a lot of what Joe is talking about are very specific, um, you know, specific actions that can be taken. But it sounds like what you're saying is that the electorate right now and Trump supporters are not uh, focused on that. They're focused on politics and salesmanship. 
how would Biden have to uh, present himself to appeal to the, you know, that sort of Trump voter? Do you have a sense of that? I, I don't, and I and I don't think I just want to make clear that what I my my assessment of what Trump voters want was ba were based on my conversations with them, not sort of writ large. There could be plenty of people who would like to see sort of lower taxes and 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 standard Republican policies. I think a lot of establishment Republicans who came home are hoping for those sort of traditional supply side issues. As for how Biden appeals to those voters, I mean, I, I think that it. To, to me, that's like asking how does how how should Trump try to win over Hillary Clinton voters in 2016? That's not really his job, right? His job is to turn out his his supporters in in greater numbers. And I think if more people like what he's selling than what Donald Trump is selling this time, he will win. He may on his coattails. He Democrats may also take the Senate and the House. That will make it a lot easier for him to enact his policy agenda. But I, I'm not sure. It's just it's it's a recurring theme in American politics, especially over the last. 20 years that that persuasion has grown much less important than mobilization. You need to get your voters to the polls. And if you can persuade people on the margins, all the better. And I think we've seen that a bit, especially if you look at the numbers that, that Biden's putting up with, with seniors. They're extraordinary. He's doing much better with, with white working class voters, with non-college graduates. So there is some persuasion happening because of the way, I would say because of the way that 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 things have played out over the past four years, but I don't think it's anything a single politician can do or anything he can do. Got it. And and Joe, I wanna ask you, this is a question from uh, Steve Ross. Thank you, Steve. Um, why concentrate on income tax for the top 1%? And I'm just gonna summarize the question. Canceling the Trump tax cuts raises only $30 billion a year more. The real issue is assets. If we tax assets over $50 million at 2% a year and there's no evasion, Senator Warren says we can raise $300 billion or more, more a year from the super rich. What do you make of that? Oh, I think there's a lot of support for the wealth tax. And, and I thought it was a, uh, uh, a good proposal. Um, interesting that all could of Republicans uh, support uh, a wealth tax. Um, so uh, I don't view these as mutually exclusive. I think we have to have a fair income tax system. But uh, the accumulation of tax avoidance that has led in part to the enormous buildup of wealth at the top, including uh, much of that is based on the ability to uh, take advantage of market power, the ineffectiveness in our antitrust enforcement. I think all of those give reasons why uh, these are complementary policies. Let me bring up another audience question because we're beginning, we're getting to the end of our talk. So I want to make sure that everyone gets it or we get to address many questions. Um, let's see. Capitalism and the inequality created thereby seems to be the problem which underlies all the other problems of our time. How can we fix that? Um, John, maybe let me just tweak this one a little bit for you. There seems to be a lot of uh, appreciation among um, Trump supporters for um, his, his supposed success as um, a businessman. Um, so at the same time, it's, it seems like there's appreciation for this inequality. Is, is that what you're seeing with the voters you've spoken to? I don't know. I mean, I'm a journalist and fixing capitalism is, is well above my pay grade. I mean, I would, I would only say that, that, that back when we were able to get on planes and talk to people without anxiety, I was on the road a lot during the Democratic primary, so I saw the enthusiasm uh, engendered by Senator Sanders and Senator Warren. And I saw a deep suspicion of capitalism, especially on the left. And I think that has a lot to do with the way the system has not been as responsive as it should be. I think that capitalism is not a goal. It's not a, it's not a religion. It's, it's a means to an end. It's a means to distributing money as widely and efficiently as possible. And to the extent that it does not do that, then there will be suspicion of the system. And that turns into turns into a large political problem. As to how to so, fix capitalism, I'm turning it over to the guy who knows. 
So the, the subtitle of my book that you began with, The People, Power, and Profits, is Progressive Capitalism for an Age of Discontent. And I wrote the book in, in part to, to say the kind of capitalism that we've had uh, hasn't been working. Very clear. It's delivered for the top 1% or top one-tenth of 1%. Uh, incomes uh, at the bottom 90% have essentially stagnated. And the people without a high school education have seen their incomes go down. So uh, the import of all that is that we need a different kind of capitalism. Uh, the perspective that I try to put forward there is that you need, uh, as part of the system, uh, the incentives of a market economy, but it has to be tempered. It has to be regulated. Uh, there has to be a new social contract where a government plays an important role, uh, not just in regulation, but investing in science, education, health. Uh, we realize how important now government is in protecting us against calamities like a pandemic, uh, hurricanes, fires. Uh, we, we, so this, this idea that started in the 1980s with Reagan, that the government is the problem, really got us off course. Uh, you need a right balance. And what I try to describe in the book is how to achieve that right balance. And part of the balance, I argue, is a richer set of, uh, a richer ecology of institutional arrangements. You know, uh, we often oversimplify and talk about the government and the market. But there are lots of other institutional arrangements. Our best universities, or among our best universities, are foundations. Harvard, Yale, Columbia are all uh, not-for-profit foundations. Um, we have very successful cooperatives. The only part of our financial system that, uh, that that did not engage in the worst practices and that continued after 2008 to lend to small and medium-sized enterprises were our credit unions, which are cooperatives. So I, what I think is that we need to rethink the, set, the re relationship between the private and the public sector and the civil society and to think about different kinds of arrangements some of which may work a lot better in the 21st century. Hmm. To go back um, the, the impacts of the tax bill, and I know we've veered off into um, politics, but they're all so obviously um, intertwined. So thank you, audience, for, for bearing with us. Um, Joe, one of the stated objectives of the president's tax bill was to repatriate money. This is a question from Chris Altman, um, right? To bring back companies were going overseas where taxes were lower, it was cheaper um, to do business. And this was actually, this idea had bipartisan support, right? Um, did it work? Did we, did we bring um, overseas jobs and tax dollars back to the United States? And no, uh, investment actually has not been doing very well in the United States. As I said, most of the benefits went into share buybacks. Uh, but quite frankly, the one good part of the tax bill was that it began uh, an attempt to, cir uh, to circumscribe some of the tax avoidance that a lot of multinationals, including American multinationals, have done. But the disappointing part of the Trump administration, many, you know, is that they didn't follow up on that. There's a global discussion going on now. Uh, how do we make sure the multinationals really pay their fair share of taxes? And they haven't been doing that. You know, the quintessential example was Apple in Ireland paying a minuscule fraction of its profits, claiming that all the profits it was making in Europe were attributable to a few hundred people working in Ireland and then doing a special deal with Ireland that got its taxes down. Now, and when Ireland started with their too much scrutiny, they moved to Channel Islands. Um, 
there is a framework of discussion of uh, ending that kind of tax avoidance activity uh, going on at the OECD and the IMF. And the United States has been a major obstacle to getting a global agreement of a minimal, decent minimal tax for multinational, stopping the competition to the race to the bottom and uh, making sure that these companies pay their fair share of taxes. You know, it actually weakens the United States and other countries when multinationals can avoid taxes and small businesses, you know, they can't do the kind of tricks that Apple and Google and the other companies can do. And so it puts at the small businesses at disadvantages, at a disadvantage contributing to more inequality and actually slowing our economic growth. Trying to unmute my mic. Um, so one thing I'm really curious about, um, and then we'll kind of ask last we'll wrap up. Your thoughts on the the postal service. This is this is this is like a pet fascination of mine. Um, the government has not been supportive of the postal service, and we're seeing it um, now at this critical time. The election is coming up. There's a pandemic going on. Lots of people are going to have to vote by mail. But even above and beyond that, there's so many um, there's so many citizens of the country who are dependent on the post office to live their everyday lives. I've read stories about rural voters receiving boxes of red chicks, right? You order baby chicks, they come in the mail. Voters who get their um, medication um, because the Trump administration has been um, effectively uh, cutting support for the Postal Service. Um, what kind of impact do we think that might um, have moving forward um, on voters and uh, the way we function as a government, I guess? Well, let me put forth my preferred policy proposal because I would love to hear Joe's thoughts on it too. I would love to see the Postal Service offer banking services. I think it has this, it has this vast network of physical branches. There are too many people who are underserved by the financial industry, by who, who have too few financial services in inner cities and rural areas. Uh, in, in Certainly in France, in the Netherlands, in much of Western Europe, the post office offers, is, is effectively a bank, is a bank. I think that if we allowed the postal service to do that, it would raise the money it needs to cover the deficits that it's forced to run. Um, and would benefit Americans immensely. That's 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 what I'd like to see the Postal Service do. I agree. And let me just say, one of the things that, uh, one of the problems that a lot of rural areas face is that uh, uh, they're isolated. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 difficulties being integrated with the rest of society. They're at a distance. And... Uh, this is not only true in the United States, but it's true elsewhere. As public transportation systems have gotten weakened, they become more isolated. And uh, one of the important aspects of our telecommunication system is that we imposed universal service. Mm -hmm. We said uh, to the private telephone companies, you can't pick and choose, you can't cream skim. It's a lot cheaper to serve the cities because you have dense networks, but part of being a country is you have to serve everybody. We call those universal service obligations. In the delivery, we haven't done that. So the, the private deliverers can basically cream skim. And that leaves the burden of making sure there's some degree of connectivity to the post office. And the irony is that uh, Trump is supposed to be caring about the rural areas. Uh, disproportionately, they are his voters. And yet by undermining the rural, uh, the, undermining the post service, He's making them more isolated. Uh, 
uh, and increasing the disparity between them and the rest of the country. It's the wrong way to go. And I think the John's proposal is a proposal that, you know, other countries have done and is a good basis for going. It, it solves two problems at one time. It, it, it creates a, a financial linkage serving the under, underserved and at the same time uh, uh, providing a better uh, financial basis for the delivery of packages and mail. Um, all right, I'm looking at the clock and well aware now that we have to wrap up. Any, any final thoughts? Trump's tax bill, prom Trump's tax bill promised us two marshmallows now. Um, did, we get, did we get a marshmallow at all? <laughs> I don't know. No, we didn't get any marshmallow at all. Let me just say, it was like uh, we've been talking about pure deception. It was wrapped up as a big tax cut in the hopes that nobody would look inside that Christmas present. And most Americans didn't get a real present. They got a chunk of coal in their in their stocking uh, they they got something that was uh a little bit uh more uh, today but the long run was a tax increase and the tax cut all went to the corporations and the billionaires and millionaires uh, in fact it's divided uh, in the long run if you're in the upper part of the income distribution, you welcome it. If you're the bottom part, it was a tax increase. And most of the money at the top uh, of the tax decrease went to the people at the very, very top. They got all the marshmallows. Okay. John, any last thoughts? Uh, no last thoughts. I thought I, I, I've been, I, I'm very grateful. No last thoughts except to say thank you for not asking me to predict the outcome of the presidential race. Um, I'm out of the prediction business. So, Thank you so much. Um, thanks thank to you, our very special guests, John Fassman of The Economist and Joseph Stieglitz. Um, you have some great books to order. The links for both John and uh, Joe's books are in the comments. Um, and our final episode of The Heist about Trump's 2017 tax bill uh, is coming out on Thursday. So we hope you will listen. Um, thank you so much uh, to the both of you again. It's been a real pleasure. My thank pleasure. You. Thank, thank you, Sally. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye.